so then I'll pass. I'll introduce myself first and then I'll pass it over to Michelle. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Mark, for a beautiful introduction for both of us. And thank you for having us tonight. Um, my name is Caroline DiFilippo. You please call me Caroline tonight. Um, I am a physician, an internal medicine provider by training. I also serve as a medical director at Caremount um, in the neighborhood of Katona for those who are local. Um, I wear two very distinct hats in my professional career. Um, so I'm an internist 50% of the time and do a lot of clinical care, um, see some familiar faces out there, but I won't violate HIPAA tonight, um, but very nice to see familiar faces. And in that time, I really give a lot of myself to my patients. Um, I really, I see my patients as an extension of my family. I grew up in this area. And so really the community that I serve is the community that I live in and the community I've known my entire life, which is a very special gift and one I don't take for granted. Um, the second hat I wear though, is I'm also a medical director. Mark, I got a promotion. I'm now a medical director. Oh. <laughs> uh, and in that role, my master's in public health comes in and I'm really in charge of our population health activities at Caremount. And the one that's most relevant to this conversation is serious illness conversations and end of life care. Before I came to Caremount four years ago, we didn't have a structure surrounding these conversations. We didn't have any palliative programs. We had loose affiliations with hospice, but nothing that really brought it all together to not only support our patients, but also support our providers. And I think that's one of the perspectives I'll add tonight. Um, this is all really hard for the doctors and the patients. Um, both of us struggle with these conversations and both of us avoid these conversations quite often. And so I brought in a tool and have been training our doctors and our, all of our providers, actually not just physicians at Caremount now for about three years on how to navigate these conversations and building a program around that. And the final part of my story is this past weekend, I learned how to write about it. And I attended a narrative medicine workshop at Columbia that I'll be happy to share some skills from where I really learned the power of reflection and active listening and how that really brings this whole process together. And then my hope is to further translate that to Caremount and to all of you. So I'll pass it over to Michelle. Hi everybody. So nice to meet and see everybody. Um, so I am so happy to be here. And again, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I have a private practice in Harrison um, and it really, the focus more is on the type of treatments that I do. And I see all different age, you know, clients, um, but I, my, primary focus is on um, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, um, ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, and EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Um, and I'll explain some of that when we, you know, when we have our conversation. I also have a nonprofit organization, which is called Through My Eyes, which is T-H-R-U. And it offers free clinically guided videotaping for chronically medically ill individuals who want to leave a, leg, a video legacy for their children and loved ones. Um, so end of life, of course. Um, and you know the type of conversations obviously that we have and formulate and have been videotaping for years really has taught me so much and has helped me so much in my practice and working with people at you know, end of life. Um, I teach also at NYU. I'm an adjunct at NYU and I teach a mindfulness practice class a graduate mindfulness practice class. So a lot of my work also is in mindfulness, mindfulness base. Um, I'm on the board of directors of the Boys and Girls Club in Mount Vernon. And I am also on the board of directors of Westchester Trauma Network in Westchester, because I do a lot of trauma work as well. And really love the work that I do. And I'm excited to have this conversation with all of you. Awesome. So where we wanna begin um, is with the why. And before I jump into that, I really mean it. Um, we both mean it. Please put questions in the chat. Um, it's hard to interrupt us as we're speaking, but please ask questions, stimulate us. We want this to be really an engaging conversation. Nothing would be more disappointing if we just talked to each other the whole time. So join in the conversation. Um, so the why. So I think we all have a story as to why we're here tonight. And we all have a reason why you chose to follow this Zoom link and come tonight. And I think that's important for us as individuals, but for us as a society, the why is starting to change. And if you think about two years ago now, two years and a month ago now, the why really shifted for everybody. We went from those who lived with chronic and serious illness to being vulnerable, knowing something could happen or was going to happen to this unpredictability that COVID brought into our world. And suddenly people could become quickly and seriously ill with limited notice. And that introduced a permission, I would argue, to start to have these conversations. And so the why is the time is right 
it was always the right time, but more than ever, there's an appetite and an openness and a willingness to have these conversations. And it is important because we are still unfortunately in this unpredictable pandemic that we live in. From a physician's perspective, I wanna to explain to you why it's easy and why it's hard to have these conversations. So for our training, much of what we learn is the importance of communication without a doubt. And we have all sorts of communication skills, but the framework within which I learned how to have these conversations was one of a barrier. You know, reflect the patient's wishes, reflect what they're saying. Don't share necessarily your emotions. And that's hard. And for some people that comes really naturally and for some people that's very uncomfortable. And I'm sure you all know extremes of that. People who are a wall and, and they're telling you something horrible and you're telling them something horrible and you get nothing back. And then those who are crying right there with you. And it's really hard sometimes to find that right balance. And that's not something that's spoken about in medical training. It's not something that's acknowledged. And it's really not acknowledged about what your own personal experiences are that may bring you to those conversations and may impact how those conversations impact you. So the training is not really something that integrates communication skills within the medical system. The second thing is when you think about a visit with a clinician, there's often a goal. They're very goal-directed visits, right? I'm here because I have chest pain. I'm here because my heart doesn't feel good, whatever it may be. And to have a conversation about not that goal, but your broader goals about what's important to you in your life takes a pivot. It's hard to shift when you're used to this didactic. You tell me a problem, I tell you a solution to one that's more of a collaborative conversation. That is very challenging when you do 90% of your day one way, and then you've got to shift it another way. And once again, something that can be different, something that can be uncomfortable, but not something that's impossible because you can train people how to do that. So I think about one patient that comes to mind who's a patient I've had for about 10 years now, who is a chronically ill, underserved individual um, with a limited uh, educational status. And when he comes to me, we don't really talk in the way that the traditional doctor visit goes. I don't say, hey, how's your diabetes? I do say, how, how's your diabetes? And he tells me it's terrible. And then the rest of the visit, we talk about everything else that's going on in his life. What's going on with transportation? Have you been able to get to work? Are you still mad at the person you're living with? How is that impacting you? Did you get any special meals this month? Were you able to eat something other than your microwave meals? And how that profoundly impacts his ability to access care. But that's a shift in the relationship and frankly, a shift in how I get paid and how I get reimbursed. But I recognize the value of how that allows me to treat that person better and know him as more of a person. So remembering this construct that we work in is not one that really supports these types of conversations. And that's my third comment about this, which is the system. So most people will tell me they don't want to die in a hospital. I'd say 80% of Americans from studies have said that very clearly, please don't let me die in a hospital. It's really hard to not die in a hospital unless you put work in in advance. And what does work in in advance mean? That means having conversations, learning how to have conversations, both with your loved ones, your healthcare professionals, and everybody around you and learning what, how to speak to yourself, knowing your own limits, knowing what scares you, what your fears are, having some really uncomfortable situations presented to you and saying, hmm, how do I feel? And being willing to be flexible with that. Because a lot of people will have a living will. They'll do something with their lawyer. It will sit in a dusty safe. You'll never take it out. And then something happens in a family's reading and saying, none of this applies. How do I make this translate? I don't know, right? <laughs> Just as hard. And so these are not one conversation. These are a series of conversations. But as I said, the system is going to default to do more bring you back more treatment. And we need both the patients and the providers to challenge that. And once that momentum gets going and one test leads to a CAT scan, which leads to a biopsy, which leads to a complication, it's hard to stop it. And so part of my goal for all of you tonight is to see the challenges in the system, in the training, so you are your own best advocates and for your patients and your loved ones. So you can kind of challenge that and say, hang on, I need another conversation. I need to ask some more questions. I'm not ready to move forward with that. And then the last point I'm gonna bring up is actually kind of an interesting one that I think is gonna be a little revolutionary for everybody. We're moving towards the system of open medical notes. Um, and what that means is medical notes, at least outside of certain subspecialties are going to be visible to patients more and more. There's legislation that's already gone through and systems are working on trying to make them visible. Some are already visible, some are not totally visible yet. 
But what that means is you have an encounter with your provider, you can go home and log in and see everything that that provider was thinking and trying to process with you. And you may learn quite a surprise saying prognosis is poor, patient has poor understanding of next steps, whatever the terms that may be used, or you may say they wrote nothing. What did we really talk about? So I think that's yet another opportunity when we're approaching serious illness and end of life to really try to bridge that gap. Because I can tell you a lot of times my notes reflect my thinking, but not necessarily my speaking. And I make a lot of assumptions um, that patients understand, that patients are following me, and I'm not always right on those assumptions. So I think it's important to use the tools and evolve with technology to help us to continue these conversations as opposed to shut them down. So I'm gonna pause there and pass it over to Michelle. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, again, from the point of view of you know, being a clinician, obviously, which is a little bit of a different role and what comes up in terms of difficult conversations in general. And I think I also wanna say, when we talk about grief and loss, right? we're talking about end of life, but there's all different ways that we experience grief and loss. So I wanna make that a little bit more expansive, right? And especially today and what's going on in the world, I don't think there's anyone that's unscathed, you know, to some extent, right? We're talking about a war, you know, we're talking about COVID, we're talking about, um, you know, racism. We're I mean, I could go on and on, climate change. And again, I could go on and on. Um, so all of us are impacted in so many, so many, you know, detrimental ways that really um, tend to evoke a lot of feelings and distress and et cetera. So I think it has to be vocabulary that we're familiar with, whether we like it or not. And, you know, from the vantage point of a clinician, how do we experience that? Like we're processing that, you know, individually, and then we have to talk about it with others. And that's difficult. So to really hone in and acknowledge our own suffering in the process and be in touch with those counter-transference kind of, you know, feelings that come up too, you know, and those are obviously emotion, you know, some emotional entanglement that we could have sometimes with our, with our clients because of what it evokes in us. And, you know, when I was preparing this, I was thinking about what ways do kind of language and communication play into our work. Um, so, we naturally try to avoid feeling uncomfortable. So it's likely that we would want to avoid these kind of conversations. That makes sense. So we have to go out of our comfort zone often and experience what it feels to feel avoidant or to feel uncomfortable, which are things we are trying to role model, obviously, to our clients. But I'm just really talking about, in general, this kind of entanglement that becomes a little bit complicated sometimes. Um, and then the other piece of it also is how do we convey it in a way that's compassionate and really is empathetic? And that sometimes is also very challenging, especially when we're trying to also regulate our own emotions at the same time. So it's kind of a broad, you know, a lot of broad things to um, think about. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk about two clients um, as examples um, that I had to contend with in a moment. And it was like I said, it was like in the moment where I had to really be present and mindful so that I can be compassionate, empathetic to their needs. So I had a client that I was working with. I've been actually working with her for, I can't even remember how many years now, but um, I think about 18 years, I would say. And I've been with her through the death of her mother, her twin sister, her father-in-law, and I could go on, on and on. She's just had, you know, so many losses in her life. So we took, she actually comes to see me, you know, we live far away from each other, but she was coming every other week. And she decided she wanted to take a little bit of a hiatus, which was completely appropriate. And then she, she actually texted me and said, you know, oh, could I talk to you? So I said, why don't you come in? I haven't seen you for a bit, you know, come in. She came to my office and the look on her face, I knew there was something that really went wrong. Like it was just something I, I could tell. And she, and she goes, you didn't hear? I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, you know, her daughter was killed, her 21 year old daughter. And it was her only daughter, three kids and only daughter. And I, I mean, I know when I remember when her daughter was born, 
it was, you know, so obviously devastating. Um, and more so than any other death she experienced. So I'm going to say that too, it was the death of her child. Uh, and she expressed that. So, you know, just something to know, a week before this happened, I lost um, my nephew a day shy of his 16th birthday. He died in an accident. And I just got back, you know, we traveled to Israel for the funeral. I just got back literally from, you know, the funeral and the shiva and everything else. And then she came into my office and I was just so overwhelmed with grief. It was coming at me, literally. I felt like plummeted by grief. And I, I, I burst out into tears because I was so bereft for her, for me, et cetera. And just the injustice of the world. <laughs> um, in that moment, I had to decide how much I was going to disclose or not disclose to her. And it was appropriate in the moment. And I decided to share with her my experience. And it was, again, you know, really assessing the appropriateness of it, et cetera. And wanting to obviously um, hone in on her experience more than mine. Um, and you know, we sat together, literally sat together, and shared, shared our grief, shared our compassion for one another. And she looked at me and she said to me, "I forget that you're human." <laughs> and you know, it was it was one of those moments. She needed to see me as human in that moment. And by disclosing what I did, it allowed her to feel connected to me, even on a greater level that she already did, which was, which was you know, so important for her in that moment. So that's just one example. The other example that came up, and this actually came up pretty recently, I was seeing um, a couple and uh, continued, to see, um, continued to see them. And it was primarily over their children, actually. It was helping them with some parenting you know, challenges they were having. So towards the end of the treatment, um, you know, they went on a trip, it was the summertime. And then, you know, he, they came back after the summer and he developed prostate cancer, the husband. And then I didn't see her for, you know, quite a while. Anyway, she circled back to me and he ended up, unfortunately, he, he lived for about nine months. It was really shocking and very sudden and unexpected. Um, so we, I was doing EMDR with her, which is um, a certain type of, you know, particularly trauma treatment, but it's used for other things too. And she was so distressed because she couldn't understand why it was that her husband was so angry and he was so generous and kind to everybody else except for her upon his death. He was angry and frustrated and agitated. And she said to me, I never got to say goodbye to him. I never, he never said, I love you to me. I never said, I love you to him. We never had a tender moment before he died. He was just so angry. And I don't understand why was it that he was able to be so loving and kind with my kids and with his friends, but me, he couldn't be that way. Anyway, we did some sets of EMDR. Um, and first we had a conversation and we did some sets of EMDR. And one of the interventions in the moment that I came up with is I said to her, wow, what a gift. Do you realize what a gift you've gotten? And she said, what are you talking about? I said, he was, he was able to be himself. You gave him the space where he was able to be his authentic self. He couldn't be like that with anyone else, just you. You got to see him in his raw essence of what was really genuinely going on for him. What a gift that he shared with you. If that's not connection, I don't know what it is. And then we did some sets of the EMDR and it was so fascinating. But what ended up happening was she actually, for whatever reason, she repressed a memory and the memory was that he actually did have a tender moment with her. She didn't remember it. Yeah. Um, so these, these moments when you have these deep conversations, right, bring so much healing and love and connection, which you could never get if you avoid these conversations. So I am just <laughs> really stressing the importance of them. And even if we feel uncomfortable as clinicians, that we still need to have them and not avoid them. Um, so just wanted to say that. I'm turn it over. 
Well, we'll pause for a second if um, anybody wants to throw anything in the chat or briefly come off mute. Somebody asked what to explain what EMDR is. Um, sure. So it's called eye movement desensitization reprocessing, and I'll give you a really short <laughs> explanation because it has a lot of uh, obviously um, science behind it and other things. But basically, it's uh, it's bilateral stimulation. So you're using your senses. Uh, you could use audio, which is obviously right. Um, you know, you're listening, right? Auditory. You could use tactile, which is touch. And those are like, let's say with buzzers. So it's uh, vibrations back and forth. It's a light beam, which goes back and forth, which is visual. So we use our senses. I usually use two different types of mediums. And what it does is it allows for whatever reason, we don't know why this is, but it allows having that bilateral stimulation allows for us to go deep into our subconscious and our unconscious. So we're able to process on a much, much deeper level. And um, there's science behind it, which I won't get into, but that's generally it on, you know, in a nutshell. And I think what that reminds me of is some of the conversations I've had with patients. I, I realize how quickly they are to give me a strong reaction to something, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to the hospital, whatever it is. It's really important to me that, and I can think of one patient who was very sick with a chronic respiratory illness and she just wanted to get her hair cut and she was perseverating on getting her hair cut. And so finally I said, fine, I won't send you back to the hospital, go home, do your hair, whatever you want. Ultimately, she actually wound up on hospice so she could get her hair cut. And I was so confused um, and it took a series of visits. And as it turned out, she actually thrived on hospice and is still here almost two years later after entering hospice, um, that it was really about, she was still grieving the loss of a miscarriage um, 70 plus years ago and felt the need to appear put together to meet her lost child. Um, that she was still grieving all those years later and over the course of a series of conversations that came out. But you can imagine the confusion and you can imagine how easy it would have been for someone to say, that's ridiculous. You're having respiratory distress. You need X, Y, and Z in terms of treatment. But instead I kind of gave in a bit and said, okay, you guide me. I'm giving you my recommendation. You're telling me something I need to listen to what you're telling. And maybe someday this will all make sense. And it did in her case. So somebody had a question whether you could do EMDR online or not. So um, actually the situation that I was just talking about was online. So I do EMDR online, absolutely. Um, but of course online, I could only use the eye movements. So I do have a light bar, which I actually, you know, faces up to the, to the um, camera. Um, and then somebody else um, commented that they used EMDR for one session and it was life-changing for them. So. <laughs> Um. Perfect. All right. So we're going to move forward. So next half of this conversation, um, we actually want to talk about some of the tools you can use, um, some of the tools we both use, and some of the things you can translate into your own practice. So this is the hands-on practical part of the conversation for all of you. Um, so I'm going to take you through the tool that I have trained um, a lot of the care map providers to use and explain it to you and then give you some examples of how it can work. So we use something called, and it didn't occur to me to make a slide, but next time I will. Um, it's, oh, no, that's definitely not going to work with the blurring effect. <laughs> Never mind. Um, it's called the Serious Illness conversation guide. And this is came out of Atul Gawande's uh, Think Lab in Boston. So Atul Gawande, you should absolutely read his book um, that he wrote as he processed his father's um, end of life care and how much he realized during that process that we did not have a good system. We have all these amazing systems in place for all these complex medical interventions, neurosurgery in his case, and yet we did not have an analogous set of tools for patients who were dying. And so he basically pulled together his team of brilliant people and said, hey, nobody told my dad he was dying. Nobody talked to him about his quality of life. Nobody prepared us. It was treatment, 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 oh, hospice, and no bridge in between. And so he did this to start to get people to talking about that bridge, preparing for the bridge so it becomes more of a gradual decline as opposed to an unexpected overnight. So what this guide does is it actually sets up a conversation. This is a validated guide. It's been studied, researched. It's beautiful, very well done. But what I love about it is it starts by asking the patient permission to talk about what's going on with their healthcare and have a different conversation than what they're used to. And patients are allowed to say no. So I've been using this guide for about five, six years now. Um, I've learned a lot in the patients who immediately look at me and say, mm -mm, I'm not ready. 
I don't want to go there, or maybe not today. Let's try it over Zoom. Let's try it with my loved one present. Um, so really fascinating. That starts with permission and something we don't ask enough. You know, we assume someone needs to know, wants to know. Not everybody does. Next thing it asks, though, is what's the patient's understanding of their illness? And this is really meant to be layman's terms. So what do you think you have? Oh, I have this breathing problem that makes my legs get swollen and I wind up in the hospital and I urinate a lot and I feel better heart failure. Um, but it's not meant to be a medical education. It's meant to guide the listener to say, this is where they are. They understand the word is cancer, but they don't really understand where the cancer is. They understand it's their heart, but they don't understand why. From that point, you don't teach the patient about their illness. You ask them how much more they want to know about what comes next. Once again, permission. And if they say they want to know everything, Great, now you have a little bit of a better idea. If they say, I don't wanna know everything, give me the big picture, but spare me the bad news, doc. That's important information to know. That one really resonates with me. I can't tell you how much discordance there is, especially when I treat couples. One person, the patient with the illness may want a certain level of detail and the caregiver may want a different level of detail. If you do not ask, we will only go based on the loudest voice in the room. And that's really critical. And thank you for whoever wrote that, Atul Gawande being mortal, because yes, <laughs> that is the book Bible <laughs> out there. So asking permission, asking how much people want to know about their illness is really critical. And then the part that really gets me the most is prognostication. So prognostication in medicine is kind of like a bad word. Don't tell someone their prognosis. You don't want to take away hope. You don't want to you know, make them feel terrible. But giving a prognosis doesn't have to be a bad thing. And this guide gives us three different, very tailored ways to give prognosis. One based on time, which is probably the one we're all most familiar with. Um, I wish it were not the situation, but I'm worried time may be as short as days, weeks, months, or years. Another way they do it though is based on function. I hope that this is not the case, but I'm worried that this may, as be, may be as strong as you feel and things will likely get more difficult. That one makes a lot of sense when someone has a a dementia or some sort of slowly debilitating disease. And then the third one they give is an uncertain prognosis, which applies to so many things we treat. It can be difficult predict, to predict what will happen with your illness. I hope you will continue to live well for a long time, but I'm worried you could get sick quickly. And I think it's important for us to prepare for that. So as you can see, those three different ways in which you can share a prognosis, you don't need to know anything about the disease to know someone's function, is only going to get worse. To know that things could change quickly and get really bad. The only one you probably need to have a bit more medical knowledge about is time. And that's the one I say to use the least amount. But you can see the power of those three statements. And I read it on purpose because the words are so important and they really make a difference. And then the second half of this guide then goes through assessing from the patient what their goals are, what their fears are, what gives them strength, what abilities are so critical to their life that they can't imagine living without them? And then if they become sicker, how much are they willing to go through for the possibility of getting more time? So you can see there's a progression there, a buildup. What do you wanna do, but what are you scared of? What makes you feel like you can get there? What are you willing to put up with? What are you willing to trade off to get there? And then the final question comes to, how much does your family know about this or your loved ones? To then bring together that part of, it's all about a conversation and we need more people to be a part of this conversation. So this is a guide we use. Um, it's out there, it's across the country. It's a really simple tool. As a sidebar, you don't have to use it with serious illness. You could use this with chronic illness. Someone having type one diabetes, a diagnosis at a young age, they have to live with this. They are probably having similar thoughts and similar fears and worries around it. And you can also use it outside of the medical profession. It really works well with preteen daughters in my case. Um, so it really is a set of tools that you can translate in a lot of different dimensions. I see Mark had a question there, so I'm gonna pause for a second so I can read it or I'll read it out loud. It is about agency at a time when health is taking away agency. So true, Mark. How do we enable agency for the patient and the caretaker, caretaker, which as you said, may have diff different needs. And I will also argue agency for the provider. Um, it's all about control, right? So many people feel when they get an illness like this, they're out of control. They don't have control over anything. And the default in medicine for us is, I can control your kidney function if I give you this drug or your white count if I treat your antibiotic. And so that's what we default to. But you know what? If I really understood what your wishes were and what were important, I could control when I call hospice. 
I could control when I consult the fifth consultant of the day while you're in the hospital. That's still control, but it's a very different type of control. And so I think there are a lot of voices that aren't being shared in healthcare, the patient and the caretaker 100%, but also the provider and the impact on him or her and their multiple I, providers. Go ahead, I, Mark. Let me, let me just, so, so, and this goes to Michelle also. There's, so it's not just agency, there's also the anxiety about your illness and that you may pass or you may be injured or you may be in pain. And people like to avoid dealing with anxiety. They want to avoid. And so I guess, I guess I'll leave this to Michelle more, or maybe also for you. Like, like, how do you help people gain the agency to hold the experience in a productive way so that they feel through, you know, you know, at the end of the day, that you know, they've dealt with this in a way that they're happy with, that they're, 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 they, they feel proud of. Go ahead, Michelle, you take the first stab at that. <laughs> so if I, if I hear you correctly, um, you want to know how the person who obviously is experiencing right, the illness, how they're getting agent, how they're getting agency. Right. And how, and how to, how to help them with the anxiety, which make, might make them avoid actually dealing with the questions that Caroline is bringing up. Yeah. So I, I think I'm going to answer your question as I'm going through my little, you know, piece, because I think what we're really speaking to is about the relationship. When there's comfort and connection, there's a relationship. That's what gets people's anxiety to diminish, right? When they're heard, when they're accepted, when they're validated, and even more so when there's, when there's a witness to their pain and their suffering, that's when people's anxiety decrease. And, you know, I always, I always use this example with my students, but, you know, there's a lot of studies done on resilience, obviously. And if you see the difference between those who are resilient and those who aren't, so to speak, the factor, the one factor is that they had someone in their life that was able to attend to their emotional needs. It doesn't have to be a caretaker. It could be a coach. It could be a friend. It could be anybody. Um, and somebody witnessing. Okay. That's all we want. And I, I have to say, you know, one, one thing that I've heard endless times when I speak to people who are, you know, grieving and I, and they tell me the person that made the most impact and they felt was the most compassionate and caring were the ones that just sat next to them, maybe held their hand, put their arms on their shoulder and didn't say a word. It wasn't the ones who were talking and chatty and trying to you know, say all the right things and whatever the case is, it wasn't. That's what allowed them to feel most comforted. So I'm gonna start off with saying that. <laughs> Can I add one more thing on Michelle before you dive yes. into your stuff? Um, no. Mark, the other part about the anxiety is I think we underestimate the amount of anxiety people have from what they do from their own self-research. And so, you know, think about it as a child, I'm scared of the thing behind the closet door. Oh my goodness, it's an elephant, it's a dragon, it's a dinosaur. It gets bigger and bigger and their imagination goes wild until you open the door and say, it's just a stuffed animal. But it left that big shadow on the wall. And so, so much of these conversations are about our perception of what's gonna happen. And it doesn't change the reality that you are dying and you do have a serious illness, but you may not have all the pieces put together in a way that makes sense. And sometimes even just saying it out loud is really important. So when I give someone a serious uh, diagnosis, particularly with a cancer, I say, what do you know about this cancer? So let's level set from the beginning. You know, not everybody dies of this. A lot of people live with this. Some people do have horrible pain, but not everybody does. Let's just put that on the table, if I have your permission, from the beginning. And that can really manage a lot of that anxiety. So I feel like much of that anxiety is about the unknown, not so much about the known. Yeah. And and one other thing I'm going to add on to that is also um, being open because everybody's experience is different. I think, I think sometimes we could pigeonhole, you know, and we could have attachments to the, what people are experiencing without really being cognizant of what their actual experience is and asking them, right? I mean, some people feel, you know, relief, you know, getting certain information, some people feel distressed by it. it. Everybody's different. So I think really being cognizant 
of getting to what the person is experiencing and understanding them from their point of view and their perceptions. And sometimes we don't know what their confusion is about or you know what they're distressed with, right? We, you know, we may think that they're so concerned with themselves. Maybe they're concerned about their pet that's at home, you know, that's not gonna have shelter. And we would never know that if we didn't have that conversation with them, which is really, really important. Um, so I'm gonna, I had two slides that I wanted to show. Um, is the share, Tara's the share on? Just wanna make sure. Yes. Oh, okay. Here we go. Okay. So I'm just going to, there's just two slides that I felt like they would just be helpful. Okay. So I talked before about our own awareness, and I, I really can't stress how important this is that if we're in a dysregulated state, it's really hard to be present with people who we're working with. Um, so, in terms of really being more self-aware, it's really kind of looking at these different components, right? How self-aware are you in the moment? And really tapping into all the things listed here, really like stepping back, being able to focus and listen and knowing your own abilities, your own strengths, um, tapping into your intuition, et cetera. You know, evaluating, again, being flexible and open, questioning, assessing, exploring alternatives, developing solutions, uh, regulating, so it's, again, when we talk about our own regulation and the person we're working with, we really under, want to understand from various components based on their emotional intelligence, their cognition, you know, all of these things are going to impact on how they react to a diagnosis or the situation they're in or what they're concerned with or whatever the case is, um, and building on the connection. So really showing genuine interest in the other person. Um, initiating conversations, you know, establishing good ways of communicating. I, I could tell you even like a, a minimal thing, like not being, not playing phone tag with somebody, which could be very, very distressing, especially when they're anxious and they need to hear your voice. That could be so pivotal in the relationship, collaborating and making sure everybody's on the same page. Um, exercising, you know, empathy, suspending judgment. You know, we do, we have our own biases about how people should react and how they should be and etc. And really tapping into that and understanding that about ourselves is really, really important. Um, and remaining calm and patient. So it's really important to also have your own way to ground yourself. If you do feel in the moment that you are dysregulated, and again, I teach a whole course on this. <laughs> so I could go on and on with grounding exercises. Um, this is not on mindfulness, but there's so many resources out there on the internet, um, et cetera. And, um, you know, uh, I, and I'm gonna plug my book only because it does speak to all of this, but I have a book that's coming out in September. It's called um, Ace Your Life, Be Your Best Self and um, Live the Life You Want. And it has, it talks all about, you know, regulation and how to, you know, uh, really get grounded in moments of activation. Um, so if you want more of that, you could also, you know, that could be a resource for you as well. I'm just going to go to one more slide. So the other slide that I wanted to talk about very briefly is um, conversation bridges. Again, the power of communication is so important. And we're talking about having open, flexible, empathetic com conversation, but these are just examples. Could it be that I wonder if, would you consider this, what, what I'm hearing, which is mirroring back to the person, right? What I think I hear you saying, okay, um, maybe you feel it is a conceivable that. So these are really great bridges. And you know, I'm not gonna read all of them, you could see. Um, is there any chance? Help me understand, right? There's, there's a lot of empathy in these kind of bridging um, sentences that you could use, and it could make all the difference in terms of forging that communication um, and having them really feel like you're being empathetic towards their needs. And of course, there are so many others, but these are just some that I highlighted here. Um, so hopefully they're helpful. 
So I'm going to stop the share. There we go. Okay. So I think we were going to open it up at this point um, and really see if there's any questions, um, anything that anybody wants to share, even about somebody they're working with or, you know, a challenge that they're having that they wanted um, maybe some feedback on, which we're happy to do as well. I, I would I would like to just share the, um, the last day I had with my mother. Uh, it was Yom Kippur uh, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and I fast on Yom Kippur. Uh, and my mom was in her apartment with her aide, Bri, Bria, uh, who I'm still very close with. She's just 22 still. She's just 22. And, uh, and it was Jim Kippur. I was fasting. Uh, mom was watching the Food Channel <laughs> because we wanted to stimulate her diet, her eating. Um, and she was commenting on, it's very funny, the Food Channel. I, I'll, never, I'll, I'll always be grateful to the Food Channel the rest of my life. And I remember stroking her hair and, you know, Brie was holding one hand and I was holding the other hand. And, you know, uh, it's, it's ironic. I'm fasting and she's watching the Food Channel. And it's just, it's, that's just the moment. Uh, she was gone the next day. Uh, she was commenting on all the people running around in the Food Channel because they're, they're in competition. Oh, it's a very American uh, a genre. <laughs> a very American genre. Uh, and... Uh, and I, I miss her, but I really felt that having the aide there, it, knowing she was in hospice, knowing she was going, knowing the preciousness this was there, the physical touch, um, you know, I miss her, but I really feel like we had something. And I just want to share that. Thank you. I'm, I'm really struck, Mark, by the knowing and how much the knowing allowed for that moment to happen and how many people don't get that opportunity. And I think that's a really important thing, right? Not knowing, then you don't know that time's limited. And I think, you know, for me, from the very medical perspective, that's, that's the mission that drives me. I want people to be able to plan. I want people to be able to anticipate and I wanna be wrong. I don't wanna know that time is limited, but if it is, I wanna give you a warning shot so you have a chance. And those around you have a chance for whatever it is that they may need. That's a beautiful story. I, I wanted to add something which um, we've been talking about, but you know, didn't name it. So I'm going to put it out there. Is I think we also need to be so aware of spirituality and religion and traditions um, and how that plays into all of this as well. You know, when we have conversations and not take those things for granted. And Mark, when you were talking about your mother, of course, I was thinking about my grandmother who recently passed away, who was 100 years old. Um, and I, I always say she didn't die from COVID, but she did die from COVID because she died from loneliness of, not, of people not being able to visit her. Uh, she actually incredibly um, had COVID, but it was, she, she was asymptomatic at 100 years old, which is just unbelievable. <laughs> but um, the reason the spirituality came up is um, I went to go see my grandmother. It was a Friday night and, you know, most of my family on that side is Orthodox. So I knew nobody would go, right? Because I'm the one who would go. Um, and I, I didn't want her to be alone because the only one who would be there would be her home attendant. And I, I was stroking her and talking to her. And um, I something came over, t over me and that said that I should sing to her and I didn't know where it came from. So I, I leaned into her ear and I started singing Hush Little Baby. And then I, <laughs> I, I picked my head up and then something told me to sing this Jewish song, which is Shema Yisrael, which is, you know, a prayer that you sing. So I started singing Shema Yisrael. When I finished singing, she took her last breath. And when I went to the, when I was at the funeral, I told the story as I was giving the eulogy and the rabbi came over to me afterwards. And he said to me, do you know what Shema Yisrael is? So I said, what do you mean? He said, that's the prayer that we say to people when they die so that they could feel comfort and go up to where they need to go. I burst out into tears, you know, like if I was ever spiritual, that was the moment. Oh my goodness. 
I was like, that is just from another plane. I, you know, so that, you know, I'm just saying that there's, there's these moments, there's these spiritual moments that happen during death and dying and people talk about all the time, but they're so incredibly special, um, you know, and so important to talk about. So just wanted to bring that point up too. And I think the, the curiosity that I bring to this group tonight is that you all are such a multidisciplinary group of individuals who approach this from so many perspectives. And the reality is this is truly interdisciplinary and it's best received when it is done in an interdisciplinary way. And so I'm curious to hear from folks in the audience about, you know, from your perspective, from your professional work, how do you see this integrating? How do you see us coordinating and collaborating better? So it's really all ultimately to serve the patient's needs. And I know Janet wanted to speak. She came up in the chat. Janet, do you want to speak? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm working with a client now who um, is, is dying. And one of the questions that I asked him, and it just occurred to me to ask him, is what do you believe happens after you die? And asking that question and his answering it seemed to be very useful for him. So I just wanted to share that. You've left us curious, how did he answer it? Uh, if you are comfortable sharing, that is. <laughs> He, he believes that um, we we continue in some kind of a way and and that there is some afterlife and that he will connect to people who have passed before him. And I mean, I, I don't remember all of the details, but it, it was, um, I think it was comforting for him, for him to be answering that and it I think made it a little less frightening when he was thinking about about that. It, it wasn't that I have another friend who has cancer, and she, you know, she believes, you know, we just go into into the dirt and that's it. But he seemed to. I knew he was he he. Anyway, so that that was his response. But I I was thinking that that is a question that you know can be used. I know that Gail has her hand up. And, I and, uh, and there's also a question in the chat. Uh, Gail, why didn't you go ahead? Thank you. Can I someone, have, okay. I'm often able to talk with hospice patients about the end because being in hospice, they've accepted that there's some limit. Um, possible limit on their um, time on earth. Even though one of my hospice patients graduated from hospice and lived another five years. Um, and the Reiki that I give them is a comfort, but I'm, but also my conviction that there is something after our physical bodies end is a way that I can approach them and not feel sorry for them and not feel sad about the fact that they're going to be uh, passing. And I can share that with them to the extent that they're worried about that. I can also share the fact that the people they leave behind will be all right if they're worried about that, which is often the case but it was so much harder to share with my husband when he was in his final illness because of my emotional need for him to be okay. <laughs> so uh, I hope to um, be able to have those conversations with my children so that they don't feel stuck needing me to be okay when that time comes. So I'm hoping to learn how to initiate that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And thank you both so much. 
Thank you, Gail. That was beautiful, Gail. And Gail, what I tell a lot of people is that uh, that getting unstuck is really important, and the hardest part of these conversations are starting them. And a lot of times, I serve as the mediator um, in families where someone's not ready, someone's not comfortable, someone doesn't know how to begin. And I have no problem being the bad cop, so to speak, in that conversation. Oftentimes, I end up as the good cop. Um, but really amazing. I do want to jump into the chat for a second, because I think that's a nice transition yeah. um, to some of those questions there. I wanted to uh, to talk to GT, um, uh, how to approach a situation if a family member who is the patient absolutely refuses to talk about end of life. I was also in that situation where my mother would become absolutely enraged if anyone said, well, you know, you might want to make a plan for this, or you might want to consider that. Absolutely off the charts, enraged. I'm happy to speak to that because I've been the reci recipient of quite a bit of rage around that. Um, so I think that's where the guide comes into play for me personally, um, having a very clear structured conversation. So if you notice, as I read through some of those questions in the guide, we didn't talk about death. We didn't talk about end of life planning. We talked about your goals and your fears. Mm -hmm. If those things came up, that was great, but I didn't push those concepts. So what I often find in the situation where someone is very resistant, either the patient or the caregiver, to kind of just focus on, well, what's important to you then? So let's just talk about, you know, what's coming next. And I want to live to see, you know, some milestone 10 years in, it, in the future. Okay, well, why? And, you know, is there anything you're worried about related to that milestone or you feel like it's all going to work out? So you just open that door gently, mm -hmm. but come, keep coming back to what's important to them mm -hmm. and identifying that. Um, I have found that's a very grounding process and not feeling like you're coming in with an agenda. While this is a conversation with an agenda, the agenda is to know the patient. The agenda is not to get a DNR or send them to hospice. The agenda is just to identify their wishes and honor them. And that doesn't have to be synonymous or you know, in conflict with where the patient is if they're not willing to talk about it. Um, I think there's also a corollary to that, and I think someone did just put it in there when the patient doesn't have the cognitive ability to have the conversation, such as in a dementia situation, also becomes really hard. And that's sort of where I try to have so many preemptive conversations with people. And I hate to be ageist, um, but after a certain age, I just start talking to people and say, look, something could happen. What's important to you? Tell me some things so I have a sense of who you are in case you don't have that voice to share with me in a matter of years from now, hopefully never, but I wanna know what's important. So coming back to that earlier comment that Gail was making, preparing your family members, if you know that things may change over time, to know what's important to you. Um, so really getting the right spokespeople in place and sharing with them your wishes and your fears. I'll pass it to Michelle. Yeah, so I was gonna just say one more thing is I, I think we also need to respect where people are at. It's really important. You know, we can't force anybody, you know, to talk about something they don't wanna talk about or they're not ready or able to, you know? So that's really, really important and I, you know, for, you know, with my foundation, you know, we work obviously with people who are end of life and want to leave a video legacy. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, some people have a really hard time, right, facing their mortality. So the way that, you know, that I talk about it is I say it's kind of like an insurance policy, right? We never intend on using it, but we have it just in case. And if you go into remission or something happens, it's a gift. And then people will, you know, more readily agree to videotape when they think about it that way. You know, so I think it also depends on how you're expressing it. Um, you know, people want to have hope, right? Um, it's, it's scary, it's frightening, it, you know, all different kinds of feelings obviously that come up. So I, I just think you have to really kind of be respectful of where somebody's at. I love that. I use the term plan B a lot. So I hope you continue to do well and I wanna have a plan B. And oftentimes that's actually additive, right? So we're working towards cure, for example, and they got a backup plan. She's got my back. So that actually really gives a lot of comfort to folks. Tara, do you wanna take us through the next question? Sure. Um, 
Madeline wanted to have say a few words. Madeline Gross, do you want to? Yes, I was just wanted to piggyback on some of the questions asked previously. Um, the nature of my work, I work with a World Trade Center survivor. So the nature of my patients are many of them with chronic and life-threatening illnesses and uh, complex cancers. I'm currently working with a client who is in their late 80s who was told, uh, unfortunately, by a provider kind of straight out that they are only going to live about one to two years and are extremely triggered by that. And this patient is able to verbalize that they did not want that news. They did not want that information presented to them in that way. One of the difficulties that I'm having with this patient is that I'm kind of becoming a vessel for all of their anger directed towards the medical establishment because I work in a large hospital, because I have the word doctor in front of my name. Um, and any time I try to reflect on things like legacy and meaning and value, they perceive it as if I'm just reminding them that they're dying. That in fact, one time when the patient initially got on the phone and said, I'm dying, um, I made the mistake of saying, okay, well, what are some of the plans that are being told to you? You know, are they talking about hospice? And to this day, this patient perceives my mention of that word as extremely upsetting because to him, I was saying, look at you, or to, to them, I apologize, that you are dying. And I did very much appreciate the reflection early on that about the authenticity of that anger that this person can express what they likely cannot express to other people to me and that I can hold it. Though to be honest, it's hard because I want this person to be able to reflect on their lives and to engage in legacy and, and meaning and all of that work. Um, I don't think they're there yet. And, but if you have any reflections or, or suggestions. Um... Yeah, I feel like again, in that situation, it's just being where they're at, right? You know, and again, you. you you have to be careful also because I think if you valid sometimes when you validate it could it could sound or feel infantilizing. Like I could understand why you'd be so angry, right? And then you could come, they could come back with, "What do you understand? You're not going through this. Who do you think you are, right? Like you have it good. You don't know what I'm going, etc. Right? So we we have to be careful because sometimes it could feel a little abrasive, and obviously we don't mean it that way. But more about asking, like, what is this experience like for you? And I want to hear more and I want to understand you more. And what do you need to be comforted? How could I comfort you? Yeah, it's, it's just asking really open-ended questions and making, like, literally no assumptions about anything. Yeah. I, and I love the, how can I best support you? What were you hoping I could do to support you today? Um, I often ask that question when someone comes with a list of things that I'm like, you know, I don't know the answers to these questions. So what were you hoping I could bring with you today? And a lot of times it's just listening. And they can't say that necessarily as well. I just need someone to hear this all. No problem. Happy to listen. <laughs> Not as satisfying from a provider's perspective. So I can hear that, Madeline, and what you were presenting, but really important to the patient. I laugh because I have asked that question and the interesting response is, do you have a cure for me? And the response is often, there is nothing that you can provide because you don't have a cure. Um, but I, I do appreciate also the, the reflections about remaining open. Well, he's also, he's also sharing with you the experience of not being able to do anything. Like, you know, I, you wouldn't interpret that obviously. But you know, you are now per, you are now experiencing projection from projection his own sense of being helpless. Uh, so both of you are helpless. You're helpless to make him feel better, and he's helpless to escape this diagnosis. And not that I you have to interpret that, but that can provide some kindness for you and some holding that he is actually in some psychological way allowing a small community of helpless people together. 
uh, that may move someplace. That's my thoughts. The other thought I want to share is that, you know, you know, when people are hurting, it is, these are magical moments. And it's like, this is the, the highest level of spirituality for me is, in, is the ordinary. It's just the, when people are hurting, if you say the right thing that just happens to mirror or touch them or validate or hold them, it's, a, it's worth a, a zillion million dollars. And if you say the wrong thing or you're not there, it's just as hurtful. And we all, we all do this. So it's just interesting for you just to know that, I mean, I make, I, this happens to me, I wouldn't even call it a mistake. It's what we do. And, you know, you have to forgive yourself. Like I forgive myself every day with my patients when I make, when I do these things, but they come in vulnerable. So I guess I want to ask the panel, like, just like, how can we help people who are dying and people who are taking care of them not feel like they are aliens? that they're part of humanity, just like us. So, yeah, so I, I think the psychoeducation piece is also really important, right? Because again, we don't wanna make broad statements about how people are thinking and feeling, but there is consistency, you know? So like, for example, I'm working with somebody who recently lost their high school um, senior because of a fent fentanyl poisoning. Yeah, which is horrible. Um, and one of the things that I've seen in my practice and just working with, with individuals who've lost children, and I hear this all the time, is that they have such a hard time dealing with the real world because everything seems so inconsequential. Like when people talk to them about, you know, these silly little things, you know, they're like, how could you be upset about that? I lost my child. Like, you don't know what pain is. Like you're making a big deal over that. So they, see, they feel like aliens, like you said before. Um, so sometimes I'll even just, you know, kind of give a psychoeducation about some thoughts or feelings that come up. And that's so normalizing sometimes to just hear that because um, it kind of frames it and it puts, you know, again, without saying this is how you feel, obviously. So um, one thing that I wanted to comment, Mark, on what you said before, and these are some really nice ways just to kind of piggyback what you said, which I loved what you said, is it's okay to express that you feel helpless and to actually say that when, when the person saying to you, when you, you know, you know, you're not going to give me a cure and whatever, like, wow, I, I feel really helpless to say that, you know, because when you try to come up with the right answers, that is so invalidating <laughs> or saying something like, I hear your frustration right? Or I feel angry for you. Like holding that. You know, that makes somebody feel heard. That makes feel, somebody feel validated. So those are also just different, you know, ways. Um, and caretakers, the same thing. I think it carries over to caretakers as well. You know, saying those types of statements are very, very helpful and validating. Um, so I don't know, Carolyn. And then coming back to that alien concept, um, that really resonates with me, especially in light of uh, Robin's comment in the chat of, you know, people get to a certain stage of their illness or a certain age in their life and people are kind of like, oh, I got nothing. I don't know what to do, you know, hands up. And I think that's where work like this, that multidisciplinary work becomes so critical um, because there should be lots of people collaborating, but it's the discomfort. I'll be perfectly honest, of the providers in that moment. My guess is the hospital staff there who said, I, I don't really know how to help this woman. I don't really know where to go. And that discomfort could have been met with curiosity as opposed to the barrier and the wall that just went up of, I got too much stuff to do. I don't have space to be curious. Um, I think how we respond to it though, is in part prompt us right? Like we're, we're all trying to do this together and we are all under various pressures and have our own biases and our own things we bring to these conversations. But I think I do best when someone challenges me back and says, hang on, my mom's 95 and she's doing great. And I think she really is a candidate for life prolonging therapy. And I need to talk to you about that. I feel like you're shutting me down, right? So as Michelle said early on, we're people too. And we are completely flawed as individuals. And at times we need our flaws to be called out and challenged. And I think, you know, done in a respectful way, that will really start to change the way we handle these things. 
you know, I, I did want to challenge you, Michelle. Uh, uh, I want to challenge you, um, uh, Caroline, in, in one small way. You said earlier that I gave the diagnosis. It struck me wrong. I, I don't want you to be giving a diagnosis. I don't know what the verb is, but I think it's like you're taking a journey on a mountain with somebody. It's it, we're in parallel together, trying to help navigate the boulders, navigate the dirt, see the ravine. You know, it's not me facing you and in like a power structure. It's somehow the humanity of us together on this journey. And, you know, I'm gonna be on this journey myself one day with somebody else. Um, I'd like you to, your thoughts about that. And maybe Michelle, and maybe no, think, Madeline as well. No, I think that's beautiful. And I think it's, it's actually a part of the lexicon that's flawed in how we treat patients. Um, it's, you're right, I, I don't give a diagnosis. I shared with the patient, you know, what I understand is going on and together we work through it. Um, what's the challenge there is how the medical society, how we write notes, this is a 71 year old patient with diabetes, hypertension, whatever, you know, we, we assign people their diseases as if that defines them. That's the language that medical school and training has taught at least me, um, but it sets that construct up. And that does need to be challenged. And I think that's really good. The other thing I would say, um, and I read a great article about this in the New England Journal recently, um, talking about fertility and miscarriages and failed pregnancies and the use of the word failed in medical language, as if I failed, therefore I'm not pregnant. I did something wrong. No, you didn't fail. Your body wasn't conducive to holding a pregnancy in that moment. And that's why it didn't work, right? So I think there's a lot of language that we use and you pointed out a really good one um, that furthers that, I don't know, that, that bad hierarchy that we need to fix. <laughs> yeah, so what, what I, wanted to say about that is I, I hear from so many people about things that were said to them during illness that were was so hurtful. Um, you know, from different types of practitioners, not only, you know, physicians. Um, I personally, you know, when I, when I teach my class, my mindfulness class, and this is to, I'm, I am so grateful that NYU offers this to their practitioners. Um, but you know what the students always say to me? Every type of helping profession should take this class. <laughs> it would see, be so beneficial in working with, with their clients. And it, yeah, you know, we don't do enough, unfortunately. We don't. We don't do enough teaching on all the things we're talking, everything we're talking about today. It's so critical. It's so critical to care across the board. Um, so the medical model doesn't work. We're, we're humans. We need to be dealt with in a more humanistic way. And that's, you know, my general feelings. It's a frustration of mine personally. Um, yes, Tara. Um, I, I noticed that it's about eight minutes to eight. And I know that you wanted to end on time. I, I have a personal anecdote I'd love to share, but if it's running too close, I, I don't have to share. So um, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to do the guided meditation, but do you want to share briefly and then I'll. Yeah, do... it's a quick one. Um, I was a uh, patient visiting volunteer, volunteer at Memorial Sloan Kettering for several years and had the occasion of sitting with many people who were dying, but I didn't know they were dying because as a patient visiting volunteer, I was not allowed access to their charts or to their medical records at all. So if they were dying, they had to tell me so. And one gentleman, I went in to visit him and I offered to get him a pillow or a blanket or, or some more water. And he said, come over here. And he said, sit down. And he was a total stranger to me. And he said, uh, I'm dying. And it, I was in my thirties and it was quite a shock for me to hear. I hadn't sat with anyone who was dying. He, I said, are you sure? And he said, oh, yeah, I'm sure. And I said, does your family know? And he said, no. I said, is that what you decided not to discuss it with them? And that shocked me that she, he wouldn't discuss it with his family. And he said, that's right. I don't want them to know. It would be too hard for them. And as I sat with him, he said, he, he took my hand in his hand and he just wanted to hold my hand. And then he said, would you hold me? 
And I felt very awkward. I didn't know this man at all. And I said, okay. And I gave him a hug and he wept in my arms. And I thought he must have really needed someone who was not in his circle and not trying to poke and prod him, not trying to give him a medication. He must have needed someone to share the reality of his situation and, and to grieve that he was going to die. And he, I was afraid it would go on forever because it was awkward. I didn't know him, but he, he, he sat back and in, you know, leaned back into the bed and he said, I just want to tell you um, this meant a lot to me. And he said, never color your hair because women look so beautiful with silver hair. And I'll never forget that. He was so gracious and so giving in that moment. And he said, thank you. I just needed to share that with someone. And that was, and he let me, he let me say good night and goodbye. And that was a beautiful experience. I'll never forget. This is such a beautiful segue into our guided meditation. So Tara, thank you so much for sharing thank you. that. It's, thank you. Yeah, it's such a beautiful segue. So if everybody, again, if you could sit up straight with a straight posture, and if you feel comfortable enough, you could close your eyes. And if you don't, that's okay too. Okay. Just want you to focus again on the felt sense, getting in touch with your body and feeling again, that straight posture feeling yourself grounded with your seat into the chair, your feet strongly planted on the ground and to allow whatever thoughts and feelings and sensations to ebb and flow without judgment, just allow it to be. Allow yourself to be wherever you are And Helen Keller said, once we once enjoyed and deeply loved, we can never lose for all that we love deeply becomes part of us. And notice your breath and the inhalation and exhalation. And Nicholas Sparks says, without you in my arms, I feel an emptiness in my soul. I find myself searching the crowds for your face. I know it's an impossibility, but I cannot help myself. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and David Kessler say, the reality is that you will grieve forever. You will not get over the loss of a loved one. You'll learn to live with it. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same, nor should you be the same nor would you want to. Notice any sensations in your body from the top of your head, going down your face. And Paul Coelho says, never, we never lose our loved ones. They accompany us. They don't disappear from our lives. We are merely in different rooms. And Renoir says, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. 
the memory, the treasures. They are always with us, enduring throughout our lives. Grief is the price we pay for love. The deep, enduring, caring, connected love. And Alfonsi de la Martin says, sometimes only one person is missing and the whole world seems depopulated. Those special someones that we yearn for, that we cry for, that we miss. And Helen Keller says, we bereaved are not alone. We belong to the largest company in all the world, the company of those who have known suffering. So again, just feel the feelings, whatever surfacing, without judgment, value who you are in this moment, and feel the relaxation and calmness and peace with the sound of my voice. and the journey of healing that we all embark in together, united in this community, right here, right now. And when I count to three, and when you're ready, you could open your eyes. One, two, and three. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really beautiful. It's very special. Thank you. How do we segue out of this, Tara? This Thank is you. Such a special, special session together. Yeah. Um, I think. I think it, we could do a prayer to the world. What do you think? I, I think it could be. Let's do it briefly so that we can yeah. let them go. Yeah. yeah. So we'll say goodbye with a prayer that Tara will lead. It will be very short, but it'll be about bringing Thanksgiving and loving kindness to people that you love and healing. Yes. And we hope to see you next month with our next presentation. So Tara, please, please lead us in. Once again, Caroline and Michelle, we're so grateful to you. This was just the deepest and most important experience I can remember in a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And if anyone wants to leave, I don't mind at all. It's not a problem. You don't have to stay. Um, as a tradition with Katona Study Group, when we were meeting together face to face for years, we'd gather in a circle and we'd all hold hands. So in the virtual world, we can only imagine what it's like to hold hands with someone next to us. And we just want to hold the hands of people near us, give them a squeeze and just come back to center. Just come back to yourself again once more. Notice your breathing. Just take a long inhalation and a longer exhalation. And with each breath, just breathe in the light and the love that you feel from this group, that you feel for yourself, that you feel coming from your loved ones. And just take that in and hold it in your heart with a long inhalation and a longer exhalation. And now imagine you're ready to give that light and that love 
to all who need healing, to those people in your home, to your neighbors, to your town, to your city, to your country, to the world, to those people who need love and light and healing, to those who are on the earth and to those who've passed on. And if there's someone special in your world who needs love and light and healing and you wanna say their name out loud, you can say it out loud or you can say it silently to yourself. And now with another inhalation and a long exhalation, Let's just imagine a large orb of white light and love in between all of us, around us, circling around us. And now take some back into your heart to take with you as you leave tonight and have a good evening. Thank you so much for coming and hope to see you again next month. Thank you again. I will be sending out a link to the recording within a week or two. So you can look out for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lori. Have a good night. Okay, is Michelle still on? No, she just left. Okay, because I have a copy of the meditation that she did.